I want to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a privilege to join with you uh, in worship at this particular uh, time. The title of our message is, God is still in control. God is still in control. We are going to use the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 2, from verse number 16 down to verse number 21 i shall read it in your hearing uh, the bible says in verse number 16 so daniel went in and asked the king uh, to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation then daniel went to his house and made the decision known to hananiah mishael and azariah his companions verse number 18 that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse number 19, But then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse number 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his, and he uh, changes the times and the seasons. He removes uh, kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that have understanding. The key verse which we want to focus on is verse number 21. And repetition deepens impression. So I will read it again. Verse number 21 says, He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that have understanding. I think I need to start by giving you a brief a background to this particular passage which I have just read. The king of Babylon, who was called Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream, and the dream greatly troubled him. But when he woke up, he forgot the dream. But he remembered that he had dreamt. So because of his anguish, he called upon all the wise men of Babylon to come. And when they had come and they were gathered before him, he gave them the task of finding out what he had dreamt and not just the contents of the dream but also the interpretation thereof. So the wise men of Babylon tried all they could to come up with the dream and its interpretation but it was to no avail. They failed to, to stand to the task which had been put before them by the king. So the king passed a death decree to say, if you are not going to give me what I have required of you, I am going to put you and your families to death. I am going to annihilate you and destroy you and you will not be remembered on the face of the earth. So it is in this context that Daniel went to the king and he asked for some time, so that he would go and pray to the God of heaven for him to reveal the secret or the dream and the interpretation thereof. And the king gave Daniel the time which he had sought for. So he went away from the palace and the first port of call of Daniel was he went to his friends and he told the friends what he had transpired and he asked them to join in with him in prayer for the God of heaven to reveal the secret unto them. So after they had prayed and in a night vision, a God came through. He gave Daniel the dream and the interpretation thereof. So it was a moment of joy for Daniel in the passage which we are considering, sorry, the verse which we want to focus mainly on is 
Daniel blessing the God of heaven for the revelation. It's Daniel giving a doxology or a, 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 a hymn of praise to the God of heaven because of what he had done for him. Let me hasten to say to you, my brother, and to you, my sister, and even unto myself, that when praises go up, blessings will come down. When you are down to nothing, a God is always up to something. And our altitude in spirituality is dependent upon our attitude of praise. So Daniel is giving thanks to God. And in his thanksgiving, he is praising God for who he is and also for what he had done for him. What do we get here as a lesson? You know, when things are good, a giving God praise is good and powerful. You know, when things are just in place, everything which you want, you have. Giving God a thanks is good and powerful. And when things get bad, you know, things are not well. Things have fallen. You are where you were not expecting to be. Uh, maybe you are sick. Maybe you don't have money for school fees. Uh, maybe you don't have money to pay your rent or, or, or whatever you had hoped to achieve and you have failed to achieve it. And things are bad. Uh, giving God thanks is a better and more powerful when things are bad. But when things get to their worst, when they grow from bad to worst, a giving God a thanks is best and most powerful. What am I trying to say here? When things are good, giving God thanks is good and powerful. When things are bad, a giving God thanks is better and more powerful. When things are at their worst, a giving God thanks Thanks is the best and most powerful. Now if you read verse number 21, which is our main focus of Daniel chapter 2, that the Bible says here, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that have understanding. This verse has implications that go all the way back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar. But the implications don't only remain in the past, but they also go forward to our time and even to the end of time. So this verse is pregnant with implications and lessons. So God reveals to Daniel the dream that the king yet and also its interpretation and in that revelation Daniel was shown that in, in, in the dream that the king had he saw an image a sort of like a, an image of a human being a statue which had a head that was of pure gold and the chest and the arms were of silver. And, and the belly and the, and the thighs were of bronze. The legs were of iron. The feet were partly clay and partly iron. So the head was of gold. The chest and the arms were of silver. The belly and the thighs were of bronze. The legs were of iron. And the feet were partly clay and partly iron. What was the effect of this dream from what we are seeing on it? What we see in it is that a superior metals are being succeeded by inferior metals until God establishes his kingdom. So as Daniel was seeing, the head of Gold, you know, gold is more superior to silver. But the golden kingdom of 
Babylon was to be succeeded by an inferior kingdom, a witch was of silver, and the silver kingdom was going to be succeeded by a kingdom of bronze, and the kingdom of bronze was to be succeeded by a kingdom of iron, and the kingdom of iron was to be succeeded by a kingdom of iron and of clay. So what do we deduce from this? What we deduce is that things will never get better and better in the course of the history of humanity. But things are going to get worse and worse. Those who really succeeded, succeeded during the golden era. But when time moved on to the silver era, yes, there was success, but it was limited. It was not like the golden era. And after the silver era came the bronze era. Yes, those who lived then succeeded, but their success was not equal to the success of those who lived in the uh, uh, silver era. Then if you move on, uh, then there was the kingdom of iron. Iron is also inferior to bronze. And the end or the feet, we discover that on the feet uh, there was clay and iron. And iron is of better value, is superior to clay that is mixed with iron. So things will not get better. The economies of the world are going to be crumbling and crumbling and until the end of time when God establishes his kingdom. So in this day and age, after Christ gave the signs of his second coming in the book of Luke and chapter 21, he says, when you see these things begin to happen, don't look east, don't look west, but look up because your redemption draweth nigh. So if you are living in this era, which we are in, which is just before the second coming of Christ, know that things will not get better. They will only get better at the second coming of Christ rather than develop a look east policy or a look west policy. You need to develop a look up policy because our redemption is not going to come from the east or from the west but it will come from above, from up yonder. The Lord is going to descend with his angels to come and redeem his chosen a people. So don't put your trust in the arm of flesh, but put your trust in the arm of God by developing a look up a policy. We want to go a little bit back to the book of Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah came before the time of Daniel. And Jeremiah was also a prophet. And he was shown something. Something was revealed to him which had implications on the time of Daniel and his companions. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 8 and also verse number 9. Let me yes and go there, chapter 25, verse number 8 and verse number 9. What does the Bible say? The Bible says here, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual a desolation. So God is saying to Jeremiah, before 
Daniel came that because of the sins of the Israelites, he was going to raise Nebuchadnezzar or the Babylonians who were going to come and destroy the children of Israel and take them into captivity. So God is saying, I am going to use Babylon to punish Israel because of your sins. So Nebuchadnezzar he had a specific purpose for a specific season. God would use the brutality of the Babylonians to drive the Israelites back to himself. So God here a designed a major. And in this major, he was actually going to bring Israel back to himself. And then use the presence of the Israelites in Babylon to bring Babylon into repentance. So he merged his purpose. First, he would push the Israelites to repentance. And at the same time, bring the Babylonians to conversion. So God says to Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is going to be unmatched. It's going to be a golden era. But your kingdom is not going to be permanent. After you fulfill your purpose, I am going to use others to fulfill my purpose. When your season ends, I will raise up other servants of mine to fulfill my other purposes. So he says to Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is not going to be permanent, but it's going to be temporary. And once you fulfill your purpose, I will raise other nations to fulfill my purpose. What lessons do we glean from this passage? And lesson number one is that nothing will outlive its season. There is nothing that outlives its season. You cannot extend a season that God has ended. When God puts a full stop, don't try and put a comma. When God says enough is enough, don't try and reason out and say it's not yet enough. If you look at chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, you will discover that initially Nebuchadnezzar received the word of the Lord that his kingdom was not going to last forever. He was represented by the head of gold and he accepted that another kingdom that was inferior to his was going to rise and take over from him. But when you go to chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, you discover that the arrogance of Nebuchadnezzar is revived. So what does he do? He calls upon his best architects, his best designers, his best engineers, his best builders. And then he gives them a task to create yet another image that was going to be erected in the plains of Dura. And this image which they were assigned to make was to be of pure gold from head to toe. What message was Nebuchadnezzar trying to send to the Lord? He was trying to say, my kingdom is going to last forever. The Babylonians are going to rule until donkeys develop horns. He is saying my kingdom is going to be forever. So he clenched his fist in the face of God and he says your word which says my kingdom is going to come to an end over my dead body 
I will not take it. Babylon is the best and will not be thrown down by any other kingdom. So, that is what the king did. And what I want us all to remember and to know is that the book of Daniel chapter 2 is a point of reference to all rulers, to all presidents, to all leaders, to all people who occupy positions of power all the way back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar and all the way forward even to the time of Donald Trump that you cannot try to extend what God has ended. It's a point of reference. Daniel chapter 2 is a point of reference that ought to speak to all rulers, to all people in positions of authority and to say you cannot extend what God has ended. It's God who controls the times and the seasons. He sets up kings and he was also the one who removes the kings. So if you are a president, you may refuse that it's over. You may refuse to acknowledge the votes. You may refuse to say that it has come to an end. You may try and keep the matters tied in the courts. But when God says it's enough, it will be enough. You can't fight God's will and win. You better embrace the will of God and celebrate it rather than standing in his way. If you want to make statistics, be on the side of God. Because if you will be on the other side, you will become a statistic. If you want to make history, stand on the side of God. Because if you do otherwise, you are going to be history. I have many friends who supported Donald Trump when he was voted in. They said God is sovereign. He has allowed Donald Trump to come into office for the revival of not just the United States, but of the whole world. And I agreed with them that yes, God is sovereign. He has allowed him to come into his office. But God is still sovereign when Trump is voted out. His sovereignty is not affected by what happens with earthly leaders. So it's not really the votes that put presidents in. But it's God who ultimately is responsible for who takes charge in a country or over an institution. What am I trying to say here? The book of Daniel, chapter 2, is telling us that God is still in control. Things may appear as if he has let loose this whole planet to run on its own, but the Bible makes it clear that history is his story and he is the one who removes kings and he sets up a kings. May the good Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. We are going to proceed in the second segment on the same topic, God is still in control, part two. But for now, God bless you. Amen. Oh, 